Today on episode 47 of Rail Talk, we keep the pressure on the Louisiana Racing Commission with Dallas Stewart, review a thrilling Epsom Derby performance, and look forward to Belmont at Saratoga. I'm Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds, and I had a very exciting weekend, guys. On Saturday, I saw a whale, and I'm not talking about John Green and the other big spenders of this industry. An actual whale, we can put up the video right now, out in the Rockaways, about 10, 15 feet from, my, from our boat. And it was so close, I felt the spray when he when the, the whale exercised their blowhole. Honestly, a life-changing experience, John. It's so many ways I can go with exercising your blowhole, Joe, Bianca. Uh, but this is Jonathan Green, General Manager of DJ Stable. And I'm also going to talk about a joyous occasion. And that is number one fan Skip Anderson and his beautiful bride, Kelly, are celebrating seven years of wed wedding bliss today. Today is our seventh hey. anniversary. Happy anniversary, guys. We couldn't say enough about what wonderful people you are. And thanks for being part of the show. Absolutely. Shout out Skip and Kelly and their beautiful family. Love you guys. Let's start the show. Rail Talk is sponsored by Facing Tipton. The catalog for the July sale is now online. There are 286 selected yearlings for the July sale, which will be Tuesday, July 9th at Newtown Paddock. So that's just over a month away. Sale starts at 10 a.m. That is, you know, I've said this before, but this is the July and the October sale. They don't get a ton of attention on the national calendar, but you see a lot of horses, a lot of really good horses come out of those sales. I think that a lot of buyers, a lot more buyers should be shopping them. So the catalog is now online. The print catalogs will be out by, actually they are out now. The print catalogs came out last week. You can obviously go to facingtipton.com for more information. You know, after, you know, after that, we've got the, actually right now we've got the uh, digital sale going on for one more day. The June digital sale goes through June 4th. We're recording this on Monday. Obviously we saw the great results at the mid Atlantic sale, Bolt Doro Philly sold for 1.25 million West point bought three horses coming out of that sale. One of them's already sold out that alternation cult that we were discussing last week or the week before that. So great horses all over the sales grounds and in those digital sales. We're looking forward to the July sale and then we'll all be there for the facing tip and selected yearling sale up at Saratoga early in August. Can't wait for it. We did the live show from there last year. Maybe we'll do another one this year. If Boyd will have us, but yeah, like so much, so much good action to look forward to. And facing, we wish you guys a phenomenal explosive summer in the auction ring. So there's some, some exciting action on the racetrack over the weekend. We're going to look forward to Belmont at Saratoga in a little bit, but there were some major performances to note on the racetrack. One across the pond that I think got, gets a lot of people buzzing. City of Troy, Colt by Justify, who won the Epsom Derby, as they say, over the weekend. And it was it, it was a really thrilling race in part because there was a loose horse in front. And thankfully, like everybody was OK. But they basically had to Ryan Moore and City of Troy basically had to run behind the loose horse through the stretch. And shout out to both of them for being brave neither one of them like stopped or steadied or anything they just kept running see that's what you got to do i think when there's a loose horse in the race as dangerous as it is you still got to ride it as if the horse isn't in the race as if you would normally do unless it's an extreme circumstance where the horse is veering all over the place obviously and that's how they rode that horse and what's interesting about him in addition to him now being i think four for five or five for six with multiple group one winner bounced back off a of poor performance to start his three-year-old season but the lads at coolmore as they say are considering sending him for the Travers, which would be super exciting. And they've done it already with Mendelssohn. If you remember Mendelssohn running in the Travers, running a really good second to Catholic boy. He was a similar horse that had dirt slash turf pedigree, son of Scat Daddy. This horse is obviously a son of Justify, who is a son of Scat Daddy. And they're never, Coolmore guys are never afraid to take chances. And I mean, how valuable would this horse be to be an Epsom Derby winner and a Travers Stakes winner? I think we have the pedigree too, cur courtesy of sponsors, Aryan Pedigrees that we can throw up right now. And you can see he's out of a Gallo Valeo Mare, who's a group one winner for Coolmore, but has that dirt on the top half of the pedigree. You know, and especially in a, I haven't seen, I'm, I'm not clued into European racing every single week admittedly, but I haven't seen too many horses impress me more than that. And especially with August Rodin starting the season with a pretty, you know, subpar performance in Dubai, or was it Saudi? I forget. They, those two all yeah. both mixed together in my mind now. He might be the most exciting turf horse in the world right now. And if he's able to come over, I think that that should be, I, I mean, 
to me, there's nothing more exciting on the horizon than potentially an Epsom Derby winner coming to the Travers and who might just be the best turf horse in the world. John, what, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, there's a couple of things that immediately came to mind when I watched that race, Joe. And, and, and first and foremost, City of Troy is the first U.S. born winner of the Epsom Derby. So that, wow. that's, that's an accomplishment unto itself because, uh, you know, they don't bring very many horses over there. This was a homebred of, of Coolmore and the lads, as you said. Um, and they thought enough of them to, to bring them home and, and, and win the Epsom Derby. And all the horse did before that was, you know, he was champion two year old in Europe, champion two year old Colt in Great Britain and in Ireland last year. Right. Um, as you mentioned, four or five wins, uh, four wins in five races. Um, and, and, you know, for the most part, you would say that, that the English and, and the, and, and the Irish are pretty buttoned up when it comes to, um, you know, excitement and enthusiasm. But let me just read to you a couple of quotes that I thought were really interesting coming from, uh, Aidan O'Brien, the trainer of, uh, of City of Troy. Um, number one, he said, just in general, justifies our Galileos with more class. I mean, that, that wow. <laughs> that's, that was, that was that's high praise. That was quote number one. Quote number two by Hayden O'Brien was, Ryan Moore, his regular rider, gave City of Troy an incredible ride. We knew that the Guineas went totally wrong. I made mistakes training him, and that's the bottom line. Since then, everything has been beautiful, and he really grew up. I mean, how many times have you heard a trainer say, you know what? I screwed up. It wasn't the horse. It wasn't the rider. It wasn't, you know, the conditions. I, I, I screwed up. I've made a mistake, and I'm admitting that. And he said that before the race too. So it wasn't like he was like, aha, I, you know, I made a mistake, but look how smart I am. <laughs> I, I mean, up and still beat y'all. Yeah, exactly. No, he was yeah. really good. Um, he talked about the fact, as you mentioned that, that the lads had it in their head that he could go to Saratoga, he being the horse, of course. Um, and that this is Aiden O'Brien's 10th Derby victory, all of them since 2001. And he said that this was the best horse he's ever, he's ever had that, that won an Epsom Derby. So, I mean, that in itself was really amazing. One more quote that I thought was, Pretty funny, okay? Um, and that's the owners of the second place horse, um, Ambient Friendly. And they said, they asked him, what are you going to do with, with the horse, uh, you know, next time out? And they and the, and, and the Greedleys, the, the Greedley family, the, the one that owns uh, Ambient Friendly, said, we're lucky and privileged to own a horse like him, and we'll basically go wherever city of Troy isn't. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I, was, I was hysterically laughing at, at a lot of these quotes. I mean, just, you know, it, it, they're very, like, just factual, like you know what? There's, there's no. It didn't, it didn't go through the uh, the marketing group. It didn't go through the HR. It's like this is the way we feel about all this stuff, and this is what we're saying. And it was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, and that's just honesty because there's, I'm sure there, there are tons of owners and trainers all across the world who think like that and plot like that every single day. I'll give you an example. Like West Point has Jackson Traveler, who we we're lucky enough to win a graded stakes earlier this year with, but. There's a monster in a Steve Asmussen barn in Oaklawn named Skelly. Right. And that was our plan with him. Like, we'll go wherever Skelly is not. Right. Because, you know, there's just certain horses yeah. where you're running for second place no matter who you got. Right. And it's good when then there's some forthrightness yep. about those plans because that's that, that's really how it works a lot of times. You got to pick your spots when there's a dominant horse in the division. And clearly City of Troy is that dominant horse. Speaking of West Point Thoroughbreds, Big win on Saturday for the home team. Much, much deserved for Cugino and the Audubon Stakes. Shout out to my boy, John Green. It was very classy. They were in the race and immediately texted me congratulations. Cugino had been, I think, very unlucky so far this year. He had run second a couple times. He had to close into a 22-second last quarter in the Gulfstream race. Race full of speed. They went 25 and 50, and he came home in like 21 and change. Just missed by a neck. If you watch the Appalachian like he was, he made the early move down the back stretch, wore down the favored Charlie Appleby horse, was clear in the stretch, and just got nailed by the ins on the inside by a Rob Atras horse at the wire. He deserved a stakes win. And you know what I loved about that race, John? And it's there's it, it's a subtle thing in racing, but I've seen him do it twice now with our horses, and I know he does it all all over the place with with other people's horses. Flabby and Pratt. Let the horse do his thing. Mm -hmm. And Kujino was not a front runner. He had never gone to the lead before. And that was part of like what had held him back is he was dependent on the pace in front of him to be able to win races. And the horse broke great. He had an inside draw and Flavian said, okay, I got a good horse. Catch me if you can. He did it with Ohana Honor a couple of races ago. who we went wire to wire in a Keeneland uh, mile and a half marathon turf race. Same thing. Horse had never gone to the lead before. 
broke great from the rail. Flavian went to the front and just kept on going. There's just so many riders and so many trainers, and I've, you've heard me say this before, that just overthink these turf races, and they rate the horses back too much, and they waste the horse's energy fighting them to make sure they don't go to the lead. And I understand the rationale behind it to begin with. Like, turf racing is all about the last quarter mile, so you don't want to go too fast too early. It's not like dirt racing where it's a tiring surface and everyone is retreating to a certain extent at the end, just some faster than some slower than others. Turf racing, I don't care. I want position. Kendrick Carmouche has made a living of riding horses like that in turf sprints and turf routes in New York. When other riders are petrified of the lead, he says, fine, I'll take it. Shout out to Flavian. A horse won by four and a quarter lengths, got a 91 buyer, one of the top horses in a three-year-old turf division, of course, until Charlie Appleby sends another monster over. <laughs> like that's, that's, you know, similar to your point, John, what you were saying about the runner-up connections of, to City of Troy, like we, we got a lot of good turf horses in the barn and it's just so tiring opening the PPs and seeing like, another Charlie Appleby horse right. and like one I'd never heard of before. It's like a new one every single time. And it's just, he's, he's just so dominant when he ships over here. But for now, to me, Kajino is the king of the hill, and that was a really impressive performance. No, and it really was a tip of the cap to all the people you mentioned. Uh, you know, Flavian recognized that uh, that he could get to the front and, and, and took it over. And, and, and also for, you know, that, that, that's, that's not necessarily the style of a, of, of a rider like him, uh, you know, that would immediately go to the front and keep going. Um, but, but it proved itself to, to be the absolute winning connection. Um, and, and, and should we be surprised at all that a Shug McGahee horse is, is really starting to come into hand after his sixth start? I mean, that, that's really, that, that, that's kind of right from his playbook is that the first couple starts, yeah, the horse ran really well, um, but ultimately continued to develop and, and grow. And, and one other thing that, that, you know, I think is important to, to notice is that, you know, the Kentucky, um, stakes calendar and you and I, you know, rail on this all the time about how come there weren't any Kentucky, uh, you know, stake races that were downgraded this year. And, 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 you know, the, the, the home team always seems to get the, the nod when it comes to making decisions on that. But one thing they're doing really, really well with this three year old turf, uh, group is they have the Transylvania at Keeneland, uh, opening weekend. Then they have the American turf on Derby weekend at Churchill. And then four weeks later, they have the Autobahn, which, again, I really think if you look at this group and you look at last year's group and the year before, I can't imagine why the Autobahn wouldn't be a graded stake race next year. It just has a lot, a lot of these horses that go into this race graduate and go on to other things um, and earn other stake wins and, and other black type. And, and it's a $275,000 stake race now. It's not like it's a, you know, it, it, it's a little podunk little, you know, I hate to say podunk $75,000 added or something like that, but it, it's got the legitimate purse also. So I really think that, that I don't know if it's coordinated or not. Um, I'd like to think it is, but Keeneland Churchill Downs did a really good job with this division um, of stacking these races four weeks apart. And, and it looks like the, a lot of the same horses run against each other and they turn the tables on each other all the time, which again shows to the depth of this three year old group. Joe, I'm assuming that Cugino is going to go, um, speaking of race series, he's going to go now to New York and, and run, um, in the Belmont and the, and the Saratoga derbies. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, that's to me, that's the, that's what I've heard. That's the loose plan. You know, you know, like you were saying, Shug is one of those guys who's not going to commit to a race right. two days after the horse comes out. He wants to see how they train for a week or two, but yes, that's, that's the next big goal for him is the Belmont Derby. It's going to be so weird being at Aqueduct July 4th yeah. weekend yeah, right? for those kind of, kind of races. But I think the other great thing was that he, you know, he went a mile and an eighth, which he, he never gone that far before. And he was kicking away at the end. Right. So you got to think a mile and a quarter, I guess it's going to be a mile of three sixteenths at Aqueduct yeah. is going to be right up his alley. Also uh, correction. It was the Transylvania. The Appalachian is the, the race for Phillies. Um, but yeah, that's, it's a good series of races. And I also just want to give a shout out to the dam of Cugino, adorable miss who's had three foals so far and all three are six figure earners. There's another one that we have battle of Normandy. who's a nice horse. Right. And then he's got, she's got Veronica green who's a nice horse for Chad Brown yep. as well. So it's, she's, she's a really, really yeah. good, you know, exploding brood mare, I think. Um, that's going to get more and more valuable. And, and so, have more so and before more this win, like Kujino was like the redheaded stepchild, basically of that group. I mean, he really that, that that's tough when you have when you have big siblings that that can go on and do what they've been doing. Yeah, no, but he, but yeah, he he proved his medal for sure. And Kujino, if you don't know, is Italian for cousin. So shout out to my paisan, my my paisan Kujino, and all the partners. And that was yeah, that that was a fun one because, like we said, 
like I said, he had been knocking on the door, and I felt like he deserved a stakes win. So we'll see what he does the rest of the year. Um, one other performance I wanted to mention, just because he got a really big buyer, uh, Happy Jack in the triple bend over the weekend at Santa Anita. He had been on the Derby Trail briefly last year and kind of fallen off a little bit. Got a 105 in winning the triple bend. Wow. That's another that's another division where, other than Scaly, it's like, who who do you want? in there so for doug o'neill that might be an interesting you know, doug o'neill does this a lot this horse is my oxbow like he just yeah. he gets these horses from these kind of obscure sires and gets them to show up on big days like that um so yeah great weekend of racing and as, as we turn the page to belmont at saratoga and saratoga there's gonna be so much more to look forward to and uh yeah we're gonna we're, we'll be here to break it all down for you all summer Rail Talk is sponsored by Taylor Made. Taylor Made, the annual leading consigner of yearling sales. As we mentioned, the basic dipped in spot, those yearling sales are right around the corner. First one will be at the July sale. I'm sure Taylor Made will be there heavy. And then after that, they got a, they have a handy reminder on their homepage right now. You know, we're not that far away. This year's blowing by from the November breeding stock sale. So you've got less than two months to nominate for those sales. August 1st is the major deadline. And, you know, obviously we saw what they did with Wonder Wheel last year for our friends at DJ Stable. TaylorMade will treat you like your family and they'll put the, they'll treat every horse and every client as if they're the most important horse to go through the ring. That's why they've become successful and that's why they're the leader in the industry. They'll do it for you. So hit them up, go to TaylorMadeFarm.com. And if you got some nice broodmares that you just think might be in a position to sell for a lot this fall, go ahead and nominate. And we'll see Taylor made and we'll see the Taylor boys this summer up at Saratoga and, of course, in the fall down in Kentucky. So we're so thrilled to bring this next guest to the Rail Talk studio. He's one of our favorite trainers at West Point. The king of the long shots is what I always call him. He's won a bunch of big races by taking some chances. Dallas Stewart, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here, Joe. Great to have you, man. And I thought this was going to be a great week for you to come on because Louisiana racing is in the news for not so great reason, but it's in the news. I very close, closely associate you with Louisiana racing. You know, your mainstay down in NOLA, down at fairgrounds. If anybody is watching that didn't watch last week's show, first of all, how dare you? But secondly, <laughs> Louisiana Racing Commission pulled back the, the drug regulations and loosened them, basically, and reduced withdrawal times for certain drugs, clenbuterol included. And I, a lot of people said this is a very bad step back um, and something that is, you know, proves why we need the oversight that we have with Haiza. Dallas, I'll leave it up to you. What was your reaction when you saw that news? Well, if you look at the TDN, you'll see several trainers uh, with their reaction and uh, quite shocked, actually. And, uh, you know, um, you know, this, this, the plumbuterol thing is, is, is really gotten us, you know, we're, we're not happy with it. Um, you know, I, I made a few notes here, you know, it, it just has no place in racing. I mean, it's a drug that was helpful at one time, but it's, it's an overprescribed drug. It's an over administered drug. It's not good for the horses. Maybe if it's administered properly, but it's a situation where it's not. And, you know, it's got that steroid effect and it's just not, it's not good. You know, we got away from it. We're doing fine without it. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe Louisiana thought they were helping us, you know, helping the horsemen by bringing it back. And, but it's, it's just not, we got to get it reversed. And we've talked to several people down there. We, I've talked to, uh, uh, governor Landry's assistant. He's, he's, uh, he's got some notes to him and, you know, we've been, I've, I've told him how I felt and I'm from new Orleans and we love going there and we love racing there and it's going great. It's going very good there. The Louisiana Derby, the meet was fantastic. A lot of nice horses, Sierra Leone prep there. I mean, a lot of good horses and that's a great place to prep. Of course, West Point Thoroughbreds, who you work for and I've worked for for 25 years has had horses there and done quite terrific. You know, and uh, yeah, West Point has other trainers that go there and they all do well. And we 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 love it there. But this drug, you know, has got to be put on the back burner. Like there was a I think it was two weeks uh, was the withdrawal time. And now they've moved it to three days. Well, we know that, you know, once they open the door, that it's going to be abused. And it's just it's just not a place in racing that we need. So we're on it and we've gotten word to the governor. Uh, I've talked to two racing commissioners, Louisiana racing commissioners. I feel like they're on it. Uh, we have a partner with West Point Thoroughbreds, Craig Accardo. 
uh, that's related uh, to uh, the lieutenant governor, uh, Mr. Nungesser, and we're going to do a, a conference call with him uh, with a couple other trainers and uh, Terry Finley, and we're going to just make it known. And, and I'm all talking about the computer, all the injections. I mean, we'll let the vets fight that out about what needs to be, because I'm, I'm not so versed on, you know, how much uh, about how much uh, injection uh, you can do. We're going to let them fight that out. My thing is a computer all. Right. And, uh, you know, we just don't need these rules to set us back when we're going so much the right way. I mean, everybody's working hard to keep the horses healthy because we love the horses. We don't want things to happen. You know, we love what we do. First and foremost, if I listen, I haven't won a race at Churchill yet. I'm over 20, but I still love my job. I still love my horses and I'm going to be there at 430 in the morning, petting my horses, watching my horses train, loving what I do. And uh, I have a lot of people that work for me that are in the same uh, boat. And I, now I just I don't speak for myself. There will be other trainers there mm -hmm. that just love what they do and they love the horses and they want the right thing. And we're going the right way. So we just got to we just got to make some points to the Louisiana Racing Commission about this doesn't need to be. Uh, we, we need to have it backed up. You know, we're not here to you know nail anybody to the cross. We just want this done. You know, you made a bad decision, but let's get it stopped. And right. we're going to stay on it until we get it done. I can guarantee you that. I'm going to. And I know right. other trainers have voiced that opinion that they want it done. So. Hell yeah. yeah. No, Dallas, well, that's some, that's some really good points. Wear you out, but. No, 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 no you're that, good. That, I'm that, glad. I'm so glad to hear you guys are on it, man. Absolutely. Yeah. And and it and it's kind of strange to, to to a lot of people that like the, the racing commission didn't reach out to the top trainers. Well, like, let's, like let's go, we, this is where we are. You know, we can start talking yep. about that. This guy did this and we, yep. you know, uh, um, Steve Landry, you know, he's the head of it. You know, I, I don't know him real good, but Al Stahl trains for him. He's, he's right. gotta be a pretty good guy. He just made a bad decision. He got some bad right. information. Yep. And, and what is, what is a call when, when you speak to the governor's office, like you don't have to tell us verbatim, obviously, because that, that, that's, you know, that, that's a privileged conversation, but like, what goes into that conversation? Because I mean, that that's a big deal to talk to the, the governor's office about this. I just told him out and a friend of mine, Jim and LaFont, who is a also is a West Point thoroughbred partner, is good friends with the governor. And I just told uh, Hunter, I think his name's Hunter. I just said, listen, we love horses. And the guy said, I love horses, too. I said, mm -hmm. this is not good for horses. It's just not good for horses. It's not you know, it's not administered properly. You know, the vets will drop it off at the barn. Yeah, you know, the barn help might administer it in a wrong way. It's contamination, and then you get bad tests, and it's just it's just not it's just not something we need. We have other medications that are we've been using for two years to help horses that have you know congestions in their lungs and in their airways and stuff. We have we have those other med. We've been getting along fine with them, and and it's been going good. So we don't need to back up, and uh, right. we just need to stay on this. Yeah, well, and I think one of the things that, that we're worried about a little bit was that if these rules do stay in place, it'll lead to a mass exodus of people from Louisiana racing. Might and there be being right. some kind of, you might Yeah, be right. and there being some kind of regulations about like who can ship in and who can ship out. Yeah. Like where, you know, what, what do you think? You know, obviously, first the first part of the question is how optimistic are you that they're going to get reversed? But if they don't, like what kind of impact do you think this will have Let's on just Louisiana go step racing? Step one, we've just started this. We just started last week. We made the phone calls last week. We're going to make some more this week, and uh, you know we're going to get everybody involved that we can, and we're going to get Mrs. Benson involved if we have to. I know she's got a lot of things going on, but she's real mm -hmm. tight with everybody there. You know, she's a great person, and I know she loves animals. And I'm not. I'm, I'm just speaking for her because I know she just loves horses and everything, right? But if we need her, we're going to go to her, whoever we can go to, to make this point. And like I said, they made a bad decision, okay? They're, they're, I'm sure they think that they were trying to help us. I'm not saying that they were saying, hey, we're going to make you guys use the drugs, and it's going to be good, and we're going to be better than everybody else. That's not the case. Right. It's a bad decision. It's got to get reversed. That's the bottom line. That's all I care about. Yep. No, it's a good good point. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll shift gears to, 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 to more upbeat topics, and that is your former boss won the Preakness. Um, and you were, you were with, uh, the coach for, for over a decade. What was that like, you know, watching him win at, at this age of his, of his career? Man, he got in his truck here at Churchill Downs and drove all the way to Pimlico, 88 years old. He didn't drive, he had a driver, but he rode that truck all the way, got the horse there, got him in there and trained him. And, uh, 
did a fantastic job and, uh, you know, rode his pony out there and just shows you the love and the compassion that he has, you know, for yep. the game. And, uh, you know, all the guys that worked for him and, uh, we're, we're just all thrilled. Well, one of the things that I love about Wayne, and this is something that I think that you have maybe have picked up from him, is that he's not afraid to run his horses and take chances. Maybe the horse is a long shot. Maybe they're coming back on short rest. He doesn't care. Horse is doing well. Put him in the race. I think of you like that. Like I said at the, at the Open, you've, you've won a bunch of big races by taking shots. You know, is that something that you picked up from him along the way? And like, because we're in this era, Dallas, don't you feel, where a lot of trainers are so hyper cautious, oh, yeah. only want to run the horses when they're exactly right in the right, you know, time frame? You know, what's your opinion on that? Well, uh, you know, you think Wayne Lucas called, uh, you know, several handicappers and, guys that are really good, great numbers guys to ask him if he had a shot with uh, right. Caesar Gray and the Freakness. No, he trained him up after the way well, he didn't do much training, but he wanted to pat day mile. He just yeah. freshened him up, made sure he was feeling good, made sure his legs was good, let his vet look at him and sent him on down the road. I mean, you know, these numbers can either, the numbers game can either, you know, give you some help or they can hurt you if you over, you know, over, handicap yourself um so right. yeah i mean i picked up a lot of that with him and sometimes it it stinks you know it doesn't work out good but uh, at least we're trying i mean most of the guys i work for i've worked for terry finley 25 years at least he knows i'm trying so i mean <laughs> yeah. i ain't just training i'm running so um yep. there are sometimes well, i wish i would have thought about it a little more but uh <laughs> I mean, I think the horse is doing good i mean that's my job to get him in the race yeah yep. well and i gotta say sorry john i just want to jump in i gotta say as a handicapper myself, I like guys like you because without guys like you, there's five and six horse fields every single day littering these cards. Like you need people to take shots, otherwise it's not a bettable product. Go ahead, John. Yeah. No, and 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 Dallas, you know, the other milestone you have coming up is you're closing in on a thousand wins. I don't know if you if, if you realize that you have about nine hundred and eighty right now. Um yeah. and, and and you should be able to get that certainly by uh by the end of the year, if not if not by the fall. What does a thousand victories mean for you? I mean, look, I, I just really love what I do. And I'm, I mean, it's a good, you know, there's a lot of guys that won a lot more races than me. And, uh, but yeah, thousands good, you know, but uh, still working hard to get that, that victory in the Kentucky Derby. And uh, so we, uh, we dream about that all the time. Is that the most important race you think is that on, on, on your bucket list is, is well, right to win the Derby? Because you were close. You were close. Yeah, right before. now it is, but there's others that I would like to win too. But that right now, that would be, you know, terrific. To, so, yes. Well, and the other thing too is, is uh, you're not afraid to ship a horse. And I remember we were we met up at Del Mar last year when you shipped Hoist the Gold out to run in the in the Pat O'Brien, I believe it was. Uh, you used to be up at Saratoga every summer. Now, like, what's your plan for the summer? Because you didn't have you. I think you only shipped into Saratoga last year. Uh, what's the What's the game plan outside of Fairgrounds for the rest of the year? Yeah, we're just trying to figure it out. You know, we could we could send some back to Del Mar. We're talking to them out there. Of course, we're going to, we've applied for stalls at Saratoga. You know, we want to send some to Saratoga. We're just trying to figure it out. We're in the planning stages now. Um, so talking to the owners, of course, you know, it's not just my decision about what, you know, who who needs to, to be where and what fits where. So um, you just got to be careful about shipping around because there's so, so such good racing in uh, September, October, November in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And, and and that's that's the thing. If you have a good horse, there's places to make money. There, there's no right. question about yeah, it. As you're saying, hoist the goal. He's on his way to uh he's on his way to Saratoga for the Met Mile. Nice. Oh, fantastic. Six fantastic. horses. Beautiful. Million dollars. We're gonna see you up there, we're I assume. A piece of him, Joe. <laughs> I know. Hey, that's worked out for you guys plenty well. You're gonna be up there, right? I'll see you this weekend. Good Lord willing, brother. Yes, sir. Nice. To me, to to have the again, just to go back to working for uh, for D Wayne Lucas, you know, for for as long as you did, um, and and it, it must have been like graduate school for you. Is there anything in particular that 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 maybe you remember that he taught you, um, or that you picked up just through osmosis of, of of watching him because he's he's been doing it for a long time. Right. I mean, you know, he had a way of doing things, and you know, the way he brought things, you know, the way he brought his horses over, and just a lot of things around the barn. Um, I was like 26 when I started. I'd been on the track since I was 15. And I had trained horses before, you know, but never at that level. But, uh, you know, it was a, an eye-opening, intense experience that was every day. So you had to be tough to make it. A lot of guys couldn't make it, but uh, a few did, and they've all done pretty well.
I'm proud of everybody. As you should be, man. And one last question from me. You know, I'm a New Orleans guy, but I've never been to fairgrounds. You know, obviously it's going to be a little while until that meet starts. I would like to get there in the winter. What are some of the things like around the track that you think I should do if I do get down there other than hang out with you and Yvette, of course? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great town, you know, for music. Um, a lot of places are free to get in. The food's good. You know, in every corner, the food's good somewhere. The gas station's got great food. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to do, you know, go see, you know, go see the river and, um, um, you know, it's just a lot to do. Uh, that's why everybody loves it and it's survived for over 300 something years. So it's a, it's a vibrant place and, uh, it's great for horse racing. We got to get this, uh, medication thing ironed out. Yeah, no, and absolutely. Like I said, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that you guys are on it because yes, you have such credibility. You have such credibility in, especially in that area of the country. So I can think of nobody, nobody better than you and some of the guys that you listed oh, to yeah. try to get this reversed. You yeah, just, just got to keep the that, pressure on. Look at that uh, TDN, you know, uh, piece. And it mentions, uh, you know, Steve Asmussen and mentions Brad Cox, Mike Stidham, um, uh, me, uh, Al Stahl, Tom Amos. You know, these are mainstay guys. You know, mm -hmm. some have yeah. Sometimes we don't go down there. It's going to be problems. So, oh yeah, you know, I'm not saying we're Absolutely. not going, but we, we need to get it fixed so we can go and get it right. Yep. And 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 the people in charge need to hear that. And I, I oh, appreciate here. you guys don't making worry. your no, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, good. We ain't back, good. We're not backing down. <laughs> nah, and and that's that's, that's so good to hear, especially the after rest of it. They can iron it all out, but that one medication's got to go. Right. Yeah. Totally. And and you're fighting the good fight. Dallas, always great to talk to you, brother. I hope to see you up at Saratoga. Good luck this week. And yeah, see you soon, bud. All right, guys. Thanks for the call. Rail Talk is sponsored by The Green Group, the number one accounting firm in the horse business. There's one reason no other CPA firm knows the horse industry like they do. They've got over 200 horses, won over 2,500 races, got close to 1,000 clients in the horse business. There's a special offer for listeners of Rail Talk. Len will give you a complimentary confidential half-hour consultation guaranteeing you'll get value. Call them up at, what's that number, Michael Agresta? That's right. Or hit them up at greencode.com. But you don't got to take it from me. Take it from yet another satisfied customer, our friend Duncan Taylor of Taylor Made Sales. The Green Group does, does all of our accounting, and we're loyal people, so we always liked what Lynn is doing. I mean, he was helping us with some investments. I, all the way back with my dad, we were liberal. Liberty Bell or something was a real estate deal we went on. So he was on the fringes always helping us. But we had a fellow Malcolm Sawyer and a couple other accountants that we were loyal to. And then, you know, finally, Lynn, through his perseverance and his work ethic and his, uh, I wouldn't say he ever badgered us at all, but th th just through showing us the way, we finally just said, hey, we need to, we need to, he knows what he's doing. We need to put our, Put our accounting with him it's been great ever since i've got good people there we're always looking for a better way to do things and lynn has shown us a lot of better ways and i think he's doing the same thing at his accounting firm lens done it for duncan taylor he can do it for you he unequivocally guarantees he'll find your value hit him up at that number 732-634-5100 or go to greenco.com and get set up for success with lynn and the green group so this is going to be a really, really fun week. And I don't know how fun because I've never seen anything like Belmont at Saratoga. And I know the security, I feel like it's going to be pretty tight. Like we, you know, we have a lot of West Point partners that like to do barn visits. But if anyone, any, any of them are listening and you're coming up, can't really guarantee how much barn access we're going to have. We're obviously going to be out for training. We're going to be at the paddock bar. We're going to have a really good time. But it's going to be an entirely new thing that we're just going to have to, you know, fly by the seat of our pants a little bit. And, you know, hopefully, obviously, we'll have a really good time. But, you know, it's it's a new thing. And, and it's a really – it's a unique experience, I think, to get all of those people up – that come to the Belmont Stakes up to Saratoga early in the year. Saratoga Springs Town is going to throw, like, a big party. There's going to be a cool – Really cool uh, uh, concert on Wednesday night. I think they're going to shut off, shut down Broadway. So that's going to add to the to the excitement and the ambience. And it's just really it's it's going to be a fun weekend because there's just nothing like Saratoga and Belmont has its own you know aura and own attractive qualities. And I think the new Belmont will have those as well. But Saratoga is is it's just a place to be. I guarantee you, none of these people. I guarantee you, like maybe a quarter of these people that are coming up 
would not be coming for the Belmont Stakes at Belmont Park. It's just going to be such a unique atmosphere and experience, and we're really excited for it. And beyond all of the ancillary benefits and, uh, you know, attractions of the Saratoga, Belmont at Saratoga week, there's going to be a ton of great racing as well. They've already drawn Friday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday's cards. Haven't drawn Saturday yet. They're going to probably going to draw in like 45 minutes or so. We're recording this late afternoon on Monday. But there's a ton of great stakes action. There's going to be a little bit of a different look to some of the races. The Acorn, for an exa- for example, which had been a mile and a mile or a mile and a sixteenth, one turn is going to be a two turn mile and an eighth race. There's some races on the turf like the Manhattan and the New York, which are usually mile and a quarter races. They're going to be running a mile and three sixteenths because they can't run the mile and quarter on the turf course. But Obviously, the most impactful change is the mile and a quarter Belmont stakes. And, you know, T.D. Thornton mentioned, mentioned this in his Week in Review, our old buddy at the TDN. He was saying, like, I'm glad that there isn't a triple crown on the line because the, the mm-hmm. endless bitching from people about how this can't be a legitimate triple crown if it's not a mile and a half would have been so grating and so right. overbearing right. that it's nice that now it can just be a regular grade one three-year-old race like the Travers would be. It's shaping up to be a tremendous race. Mystic Dan is pointing there. Shout out to Kenny McPeak in the vein of Dwayne Lucas and Dallas Stewart, not afraid to run his horse, running the horse three times in five weeks. Obviously, Torpedo Anna is going to be in the acorn. Huge attraction there. She's drawn the outside post. Great thing about her, though, is she doesn't like she went to the front in her last race. She'd never been to the front right. before. She can do anything. So she's not going to be restricted by the outside post or any speed to her inside. Obviously, those are the two main attractions. But, John, give me a little insight into what you're looking forward to this week, Belmont at Saratoga. Yeah, just to piggyback on a couple of things you said, Joe reminds me, uh, you know, the racing weekend up at Saratoga, um, you know, w- which is a boutique weekend, reminds me of like when Keeneland hosts the Breeders' Cup um, and how, you know, people come there and, and it's a great place to watch and it's a destination site, but you hit the nail on the head. More people are going to come to these races because it's at Saratoga for a weekend. It's something unique. It's something that's a little spicier. um, And, and people so embrace the, the town of Saratoga Springs, as well as the taking a step back in, in time um, to go to the racetrack and everything. It it really is going to be exciting just for the, you know, for the change of venue alone. Um, That's number one. Number two, you know, TD, I laughed when you were talking about how, uh, in TD's article, he said, thank God there, there isn't, uh, you know, a, a triple crown on, on the line here because there were, you know, because people would be bitching about it. Well, there, according to a lot of Baffert fans, there's already an asterisk next to the Derby. So it wouldn't have counted anyway, even if a horse did win the triple crown. I just have to put that out there. Okay. And I'm surprised that TD didn't put that in his art. Oh, no, no, I'm not surprised. Never mind. Um, <laughs> but let's, let's focus in on one race in particular that I really was excited about. And, and you mentioned it already. Great foreshadowing. That's why we're great partners on this. Is that, you know, the grade one acorn this year in particular is star studded to the point where mm-hmm. eight of the nine horses in the race are graded stake winners. Three of them are grade one winners. Three of them are grade two winners and a couple of grade three winners. And oh, by the way, the one horse that hasn't won a grade one is regulatory risk is a Chad Brown horse that's probably going to be one of the favorites anyway. I mean, just, you know, in, in a star stud, studded field, you have the winner of the uh, Gulfstream Park Oaks. The winner of the Ashland, the winner of the Kentucky Oaks, the winner of the Black Eyed Susan, and the winner of the Eight Bells are all different winners. I mean, that's how impressive this group is top to bottom. Um, they, well, they should really be calling this like the Phasic Tip and Night of the Stars prep, as far as I'm concerned, because there are so many Phillies that we're going to see you know, that run in this race that are going to be selling in November. You're welcome. Shameless plug for Facebook right. Tipton for one of our sponsors. But it really is. I mean, I would, I would guarantee you're going to see half the field in the phasing sale selling um, in the first weekend of November, the first week of November, I should say, um, at that uh, illustrious sale. But it is a really exciting race. And oh, by the way, we didn't even mention that one of the horses was the two-year-old champion in just FYI. I mean, and, and another Justify. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so it is top to bottom. It is a really star-studded race. Um, and you know, I get excited about three-year-old fillies because we campaign a lot more fillies than we do Colts. And uh, I'm glad we don't have a horse in this race because yeah. it is, we, we'd, be, we'd be running for fifth place no matter who we ran in there. For sure. And like we have at West Point, we have a uh, part of a horse named Sedona, who's right. a really nice filly. And she, you know, she, she's only run twice, but she's run pretty well both times. You know, there was some, some push, I think, from certain people to try to run her in this race. And Shug being Shug is like, no, 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 she needs more time. She needs more development. And then looking at the field, I'm like, 
Thank freaking God yeah. we didn't put Sedona in this race. <laughs> like, we'll see you in the Alabama, right, maybe. Exactly. Like, there's, exactly. there's plenty of big races later on. Like, let these girls knock each other out a little bit because, yes, like this is – and honestly, it's so – this is once one of the cool things about doing uh, Saratoga, Belmont at Saratoga. You know, as much as I love the Coaching Club American Oaks, that race has five or six horses in it yeah. every single year. Right. But because the acorn is earlier in the season and it's because it's 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 aligned perfectly with the Black Eyed Susan and the Kentucky Oaks, we get nine horses. And like you said, star studded field, even the horse who's probably going to be like 50 to one. Becky's Joker coming back for Gary Contessa. She won the Schuylerville. Yeah, but first time Lanks. out. First time out. She won the year. And she's going to be 50 to one in this race. Right. So that tells you how strong of a field it is. Another really strong field right before it. It's one of three, three grade one races on Friday, along with the acorn and the just game is the New York stakes. Yeah. It's got 13 horses in it. There are some just, you know, warlike goddess, uh, we've got Fev Rover, who obviously was a grade one winner for Mark Cassie last year. Uh, really nice Charlie Appleby horse named English Rose, McCulloch, Didia. I mean, this it, just one phenomenal turf filly after another. I do want to give a little push. There is a horse I like in that race for our, our pal, uh, or yeah, for our pal Cherie DeVoe. She's got Star Fortress in that race, and I was there when she ran second in the Sheep's Head Bay last time. They went 52 and four. For the half in that race, and she closed, and she just missed by a head, got beat by a Chad Brown horse, and went wire to wire. She's twenty to one on the morning line. She's got a one hundred four buyer in her past performances. I think she's very, very sneaky. So she's one of the horses I'm most interested in betting this weekend. But this is going to be a phenomenal race to watch. And then, and John, I'm sure you have an opinion on this. We've got the just the game seven horses, five. Trained by the Chadster. <laughs> well, they should really rename this race, quite frankly, because th th this is not an, an abnormality. I mean, he, and it's not an anomaly. He usually right. has the majority of the good horses in the race, if not a, in this case, the majority of the field. Um, although there's a sneaky, there's a sneaky non-chat horse in there that I think could do well. I mean, I'm narrowing it down to two horses, so I'm going to leave it at that because <laughs> I don't want my odds to, you know, I don't bet a lot, but I want, I don't want my odds to be screwed because, uh, because you know, because I'm mentioning it, and so many people are going to follow what I have to say about handicapping, especially. Yep, back up the Brinks truck. Who are we talking about? Mission, <laughs> Mission of Joy or Evie Jets? Mission of Joy. Mm. Mission of Joy, I think, has has a puncher's chance of of beating it out. And I just don't know, like, like I know this doesn't happen, but in my mind, in my my crazy mind, it's like, well, Chad's got five horses in the race, so you know they're all going to be in cahoots and like, you know, try to like stop the other two horses. It doesn't happen, but but it, you know, but it would be interesting to see if one of the two non aren't you rooting? I mean. Aren't you just rooting in your heart of hearts for one of those non-Chad Brown horses? That, yeah, that no, horse? totally. And this is this is it's this race and it's this whole division, but it's especially this race and the Diana. Yeah, every year it's the Chad Brown Invitational, and yeah, I don't think he would do anything to no. like compromise the chances the other do. Only only to only Bob Backway would do some shit like that. Shout out to our boy Scatify. Um, but. <laughs> You said that. Hey, not man, me. go watch the replay. Go, <laughs> go watch, watch the replay. The replay. <laughs> it was like a relay race, wasn't it? At that point, <laughs> I'm just glad. I'm glad he came out of that unscathed. Because call me a conspiracy theorist, but I feel like that was part of the plan. <laughs> um, anyway, the other the other race I, I, I want to give a quick pop to on Friday is the Intercontinental because we do have a horse running in that race. Uh, our, our girl Gal on a Rush is running for West Point. She's another one of those horses who's kind of. She's overdue for a stakes win. She's run well in a lot of stakes races. She was second in the Alley Wow last year, close third in the Stewart Manor, close third, close second in the Matron, close second last time in the license fee. Would love to see her break through, but she does have to go against the best, the best turf sprinter. Eh, I don't know. Overcharged is up there too. It's overcharged and Roses for Deborah right. are the two best Philly turf sprinters, maybe the two best turf sprinters in America. So Roses for Deborah is the one they all got to get around, but hopefully Gal can get, get something done on Friday. And then, one other thing I like about this week, we got the Tremont and the Astoria. You know, you don't get big fields, but it's it's always nice to see the two-year-olds start to break out and start to separate themselves a little bit. And this is the beginning of that baby stake schedule. So we're looking forward to those races. And it just it goes to show you what a great weekend of racing is going to be. They haven't even drawn the Belmont and Belmont Stakes card. And we've sit here, we sat here and already talked for about 10 minutes about these races because it's you know, it's it's the bet for me. I'm biased. I'm a New Yorker, but it's the best week of racing, I think, in America right. on the calendar. So shout out to everybody who's got a horse, everybody who's gonna be betting a horse, everybody who's gonna be there. Can't wait to get up there and see all the West Point partners and all the fans. You know, like I said, it's gonna be its own thing. We're gonna see how it goes, and they're obviously gonna be doing this next year. We'll learn a lot about how to do it next year. But yeah, this is I 
you know, there's not too many new things, right. new things in racing. Like we, yeah. you know, we kind of do the same thing every year. And obviously there's better renewals of certain races, but this is a completely different animal. And I can't wait to see how it unfolds. Hope you'll be there. John, I don't think you're going up, are you? I, I am not going up. Actually, I'm going to be in Florida. I'm going in the other direction. I'm going as far away from Saratoga as you can just for, for, for personal reasons. But all right, I got to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Let's say the Rangers have won and in a Stanley Cup. Are you are you watching the Rangers game, game two, or are you watching? Are you going to Saratoga and watching the races on Saturday? What what first what is all, Joe Bianca doing? They, first of all, I almost got through this episode without crying. Oh, so. stop! It's it, they made it further than they should have. I mean, you have to. I mean, I know they were Presidents Cup and everything like that, but there were a lot of times where you're going, they maybe shouldn't have won that game. Like they, they just this series, like I thought they were clearly the better team in the first two series. Yeah, this series, like Igor carried them yeah. a little bit. But I listen, I was at Aqueduct for game two or game three of the Rangers Panthers series. I went down to the paddock, I did my duty, and then I went right the fuck back upstairs <laughs> and watched the rest of that game because I'm die hard and I, I bleed blue. And there was there there it was a it was a rough weekend. But yes, I I would do everything in my power to watch that game, but unfortunately, I don't have that conflict, and I can just, fortunately, I can focus fully yeah. on racing. The hockey gods did you a favor. That's all yeah, I'm saying. Totally. The gods that's all, that's what I always say is that the hockey gods are so good to me. Exactly. You know? <laughs> really. So, so just football know. gods too. What's that? The football gods well, the football too. They gods just love too. me. Thank, thank goodness. Thank me. goodness the Super Bowl never crosses over with any any important racing weekend. But but no, I I genuinely thought it was an interesting you know interesting thought as to what you would have to do. Now you know you don't have to worry about it next year because obviously the Rangers either are going to make it or not in the in the Stanley Cup. But you know it, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting the next couple of years how they continue to build that team and whether or not uh, you know we actually have racing again at Belmont. You. Son of a bitch. <laughs> All right, so that's going to do it for episode 47 of Rail Talk. Thank you to Dallas Stewart for stopping by and appreciate him and the rest of the Louisiana Power Players keeping that pressure on the Louisiana Racing Commission. We're going to stay with that story as well. Thank you to John Green. Thank you to our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producers, Nathan Wilkinson and Julia Gresta, and sponsors, Facing Tipton, TaylorMade, The Green Group, and as always, our beloved viewers and listeners. We'll see you next week. Back here on Rail Talk, enjoy the Belmont.